Good morning. The members of Faith Lutheran Church welcome you to the 8 o'clock broadcast of our worship service from the Faith Ministry Center Sanctuary. Today is the 18th Sunday after Pentecost. Leading the liturgy this morning is Reverend Tim Griffin. Preaching this morning is Reverend Aaron Rosenau. We will be following Lutheran service book, Divine Service Setting 4. We join the service already in progress. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you today. My name is Aaron Rosen. I'm one of the pastors here at Faith, especially if you're visiting with us today. We're so glad that you're here in the house of the Lord. Uh, we are going to be talking about just the importance of that, actually. And so, such a thrill that I know there are other things going on this morning, but that you are here with us today. Uh, I, I will tell you, I, I have my phone uh, on the on a pulpit with my notes for my sermon, I, I promise you it is just to keep the time for the sermon and nothing else. <laughs> I just <laughs> promise you. If you're joining us from home today over the radio or online, it is great to have you with us as well. Uh, one of the things we're going to do today is present Bibles to two-year-olds. We're the youngest of our congregation. Uh, we just love to put the scriptures into their families' hands and so some of those are here today. If you did not pick up your Bible, those are in the back and against the back wall on the table. Just encourage you to grab that and be ready for that part of our service. Um, you'll notice some people wearing the blue Faith in Action shirts today, uh, which is amazing. Thank you for that. Um, we're just a few weeks away from, uh, actually two weeks away from our Faith in Action day. And... This weekend is the last chance to sign up to volunteer for that. We're going to send out hundreds of volunteers to a bunch of different places around our community to serve in different ways. And if you haven't signed up for that already, again, it's October 22nd, uh, it's Saturday. Um, it, it's going to be a great time. Uh, again, sign up this weekend. You can do that online or out in the commons. You get a free t-shirt, blue, that says Faith in Action on it. If you are not able to serve that weekend, October 22nd, uh, would you consider donating to the cause? Um, you can do that at the, um, the, the display out in the commons as well or online. Um, we're going to be serving meals as part of that and just getting the supplies and everything else for that. We could use um, some donations to cover the cost of that. Um, a couple days before our Faith in Action Day on October 20th will be our semi-annual prayer and healing service. So we have um, an opportunity to come together on a Thursday evening. It's uh, October 20th, 6.30 p.m. right here at our Faith Ministry Center here in the sanctuary. And then every week, don't forget that we have a Wednesday evening service and a Monday evening service. A lot of people love the Monday service because it's a little bit smaller crowd, and we actually have communion every single week, and we come up around the altar. It's really a special time for communion, a uh, great opportunity on Monday nights. On Wednesdays, it's a shorter service, 30, 40 minutes, um, family-friendly, get some of our families involved with leading our worship, and it's a great time on Wednesday evenings. So uh, just, yeah, consider that also among your worshiping options. That's the announcements I have today. I'm going to invite you to turn to your worship folder, uh, page 2, our call to worship from Psalm 118. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. But the house of Aaron say, his love endures forever. 
Open for me the gates of righteousness, and I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which Christ can enter. And I will give you thanks, for you answered me. You have become my salvation. Oh, the Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. opening hymn this morning comes from Lutheran Service Book 906. O day of rest and gladness, O day of rest and gladness, O day of joy and light, O balm of care and sadness, most beautiful, most bright, this day the high and lowly through ages join to bless. Sing, holy, 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 the triune God confess. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. And if you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Since we are gathered to hear God's word, to call upon him in prayer and praise, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, in word, and deed. 
and that we cannot free ourselves from our own sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Our next hymn this morning comes from Lutheran Service Book 602. The gifts Christ freely gives. The gifts Christ freely gives. He gives to you and me. To his church, his bride, his chosen, saved and free. Saints blessed with these rich gifts are children who proclaim that they were won by Christ and cling to his strong name. be with you. And also with you. 
Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us a saving faith and blessing, blessing us with many gifts to use throughout our lives. May our lives be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord. Help us to find rest in your gracious hands so we may experience balance in our lives and bring honor and glory to your name. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. All right, I'd like to invite those families who have two-year-olds who are going to present their Bibles today to come on up here to the front. Come on up, guys. Good to see you all. So parents, you know, it wasn't all that long ago. Some of you were standing right here in, at, at the very front of this church, and you were a part of God's giving his gift of baptism and the Holy Spirit through the water and the word. And at that time, you committed yourselves to being models and teachers and that one day you would place in your child's hand the scriptures. And today, it has come time to partially fulfill that promise, that commitment, to actually put in their hands the scriptures. And you have the Bibles in their hands. Aren't these fun? Your very first Bible. How fun is that? Yes. Well, I would like parents, place your hands on your child and as they're holding their Bible. Then I want you to repeat after me. May this word of God lead you to know God's love and his plan for you. May God bless us as we read God's word together. Can we all pray? Dear God, children truly are a gift from you. We thank you for these little ones and ask that you would keep them in your care and grace. Bless these families as they hear and learn your word in their homes. May it strengthen them to love and serve you and each other. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So, boys and girls, can you, can you hold up your Bible? All, girls, yeah, hold up your Bible. Amazing. Yeah, we're so glad you're here today. <laughs> yeah. Woo. And I'd like to invite all the other children who are here who want to come up for a children's message. We're actually going to have you sit here on the floor. I know a lot of times you like to be on the steps, but we're going to have you sit on the floor so right here. Stay you're ready to go back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can either stay or, or go come back. Right up here. Kids, right up here. Yeah. Just, you can sit right here on yep. the floor. Kids of all ages, as I say. It's okay. Yeah. And more room up here. I think we're going to sit on the floor if that's okay. I know I love sitting on this step too because I'm older than you are and it's harder. <laughs> right down here if we can. Unless you're afraid, to sit, you can do the front step. That's okay. Good morning. I want to talk about having fun. Anybody like to have fun? Do you like to have fun with your mom and dad and family? Anybody here like to have fun? What's the funnest thing you like to do with your family? What's the funnest thing you like to do with your family? Nobody knows. <laughs> what do you do? Huh? Go boating, go out on a boat in the lake or, or rivers. That's, I used to do that when I was little too. It was so fun, it is. Do your mom and dad have to make you do that? 
No. They say, let's go, and you're ready to go, aren't you? Yeah. Anything else that I do for your fun? What? Play with them? Like games? Yeah, I love to play games too. And, and that's so fun to do. Do they have to make you play those games? No, it's fun. What, what about the things they have to make you do? Oh, you got another one. Yes. I didn't hear. What? Go to the park? I don't know that park. Huh? Trampoline park. <gasps> Whoa. You like to jump. Yeah. Oh, that'd be great. Tra do mom and dad do that with you? Are they insured? <laughs> I'm a grandpa. I go watch them jump on the trampoline and pray real hard. Yes. No, that's, that's fun. What about the things you don't like to do that your mom and dad say you have to do? Are there any things you don't like to do, mom and dad? Yeah. You got more of those for sure. That was easy. What are some things you like, that you don't want to do mom and dad make you do? No. They say no to you. That's right. Say, mommy, can I have a cookie? And they say, no. Yes. You forgot? You'll remember next time it happens, so I can tell you. Yes? Huh? Cleaning. They say you got to clean your room. They ever do that to you? Yeah. Do you know what the easy way to clean your room is? Mom and dad do it. You know what the best way to clean your room is? You do it. <laughs> yeah, because you need to learn how to do that, because a clean room helps keep you healthy and nice. And when company comes by, they feel better, too. Anything else you, you're told to do? Ever been told to go to bed when you don't want to go to bed? All the time, every night it's a struggle at your house, and yet you should go to bed. Why should you go to bed when you're told to go to bed? Is it good for you? What? Yeah, you're not crazy in the morning. That is right. I agree with that one. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes there's things we're supposed to do that we love. Sometimes there's things we're supposed to do that are kind of hard. For instance, like church. Is church fun? Can it be fun? Yeah. Is it always fun? Yeah, really? Oh, great. I love this guy. You sit with me up here after we're done here. Because sometimes, when, you, especially when you're a kid, church isn't very fun sometimes, right? They're talking about things you don't understand. They're singing songs that are not the songs you want to sing. And yet, is church good for you? Absolutely. In fact, I, I want to tell you a parable. Do you know what a parable is? A, no? You love that word. I know that one. No, no. A parable is a story that has meaning. So Jesus used to use it. So I'm going to tell you a parable about the, the daddy who didn't want to go to church. Can I do that parable? Okay. There was a daddy who woke up on Sunday morning because his wife woke him up and said, it's time to go to church. And he said, I'm not going. And she said, what would mommy say? Yes, you are. And daddy said, no, I'm not. And finally, 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 daddy said, okay, give me three good reasons why I should go to church this morning, and then maybe I'll go. So mommy very nicely sat down on the bed, and she said to daddy, well, first of all, daddy, you're a sinner. We can tell this morning. <laughs> you need to go to church for you, because there's forgiveness there. There's, there's God's word there for you. You need to grow in your faith, because it's not where it needs to be. Secondly, the kids need to go to church. And if daddy doesn't go to church... It's harder to get the kids to go to church, right? They won't learn from that. So you need to go for you. You need to go for the kids. And third, you're the pastor. They're going to miss you if you're not there. <laughs> well, you know, that story works for pastors. But it's supposed to work for everybody. If you're a Christian, we need to go to church. Even if we don't feel it, we need it because we need it. We need forgiveness. We need God's word. We need the strength that comes from being in church. And our kids and others need it if we're not there. If we're not there, then the kids don't learn how important it is. And lastly, if you're not there, we miss you. And in fact, if you're not there in church, we might miss you in heaven too. Because being in church is a part of our faith that expresses what we believe. And in that belief, we get to go, well, we get to go to heaven when we believe in who? Who do we believe in? In God and Jesus. And church is part of that love expressed. Well, this morning you're in church. That's good news. Next Sunday, where are you going to be? In church. Even if, even if daddy has trouble or mom has trouble. And when you get older, where are you going to be? In church. That's right. And when it's all done, you know where we're going to be? In heaven. It's a great story our life is, isn't it? Well, thanks for coming this morning. You can go back to your places now. And we're going to continue with God's word. And his mom and dad sat kind of quiet for you. Can you do that while we hear God's word together and listen to? 
Our first lesson this morning is written in the book of Nehemiah. And let me introduce it this way, because you're going to notice it right away. In this text, Nehemiah is angry. And he's tough. Because he's got a situation going on in which, in which he has been worshiping for years on 900 miles away from God's church and people. And he finally, by God's, by God's miracle, we talked about just a week or two ago, he gets to come back and help rebuild God's church. And there's people who don't want to go to church. There's people who don't want to honor God. And that's what saved him. That's what changed him. That, that, that's, that's what saved his, his parents and grandparents. Is what's going to cha- save, save his children. So he wants to teach how important it is for people to honor God. And so this is how he says it in, in Nehemiah chapter 30. He says, in those days, I saw men in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bring in grain and, and loading it on donkeys and together with wine and grapes and figs and all other kinds of loads. They were bringing all this into Jerusalem on the Sabbath. And therefore, I warned them against selling food on that day. He said, men from Tyre who lived in, in Jerusalem were bringing in fish and all kinds of merchandise and selling them in Jerusalem on the Sabbath. To the people of Judah. So I rebuked the nobles of Judah. And I said to them, what is this wicked thing you're doing? Desecrating the Sabbath day. Didn't your forefathers do the same thing so that our God brought all this calamity upon us? And upon this city? And now you're stirring up more wrath against Israel by desecrating the Sabbath. When evening shadows fell on the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath... I ordered the doors to be shut and not to be opened until the Sabbath was over. I stationed some of my own men at the gates so that no load could be brought in on the Sabbath day. Well, once or twice, the merchants and sellers of all kinds of goods spent the whole night outside Jerusalem. But I warned them and said, why do you spend the night by the wall? If you do this again, I will lay hands on you. So from that time on, they no longer came on the Sabbath. And I commanded the Levites to purify themselves and to go and guard the gates in order to keep the Sabbath day holy. This is the word of the Lord. Our second lesson today is from the book of Acts, the second chapter. And it talks about the apostles after Jesus had died and rose again. They devoted themselves to, to, to the apostles' teachings and to the fellowship and to the breaking of the bread and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe. And many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. And all the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods, and they gave it to anyone as as they had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They, They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now, this is the word of the Lord. Would you rise with me, please? That we might share in the words of faith recorded before us by the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Okay, serious question as we get started this morning. How many of you slept last night? All right, seriously, how many of you slept last night? Even if it wasn't as much as you wanted to get, uh, but at least a little shut-eye. My guess is unless you're coming off the graveyard shift, that's every single person here, right? I mean, you got at least a little sleep. And we need it, don't we? Uh, as, as Pastor Tim was saying, you know, does anybody force you to go to sleep? I mean, maybe when you were a kid, not anymore, right? You gladly go to sleep. We need it. Ever tried to function after having no sleep all night? It's not pretty. 
When I was in college, I was studying architecture, and architecture students were notorious for pulling all-nighters to finish projects. And I, I did that plenty, had my share of nights when I'd, I'd work all through the night, and then I'd go outside and watch the sun rise. And I, I remember more than once stretches of 36 hours of no sleep and trying to function. That's not smart and definitely not healthy. Uh, in fact, one of those times, um, I, I drove a friend to the airport at the end of one of those stretches. Uh, probably the stupidest thing I ever did. Uh, seriously, I mean, it was really dumb. I was, have you ever tried to function after 36 hours of no sleep? I remember I, I, would, I would be delirious, had conversations with people I wouldn't remember the next day. I took my friend to the airport. I did not remember the last half hour of the trip. It was just dumb. You know, Americans in general are desperately sleep deprived. According to Harvard Health, one in every three Americans consistently gets too little sleep at night. One out of every, every three. Many of those are dangerously deprived of sleep. Almost 40% of adults admit to unintentionally falling asleep during the day at least once a month. And one in every five car crashes is associated with sleep deprivation. Not just falling asleep at the wheel, but lack of focus, um, slow reaction time, because of physical exhaustion. Do you know the United States leads the world in caffeine consumption? Did you know this? 971 tons a year of caffeine. 971 tons! Okay, consider that one cup of coffee has less than 100 milligrams of caffeine, and there are a billion milligrams in a ton. 971 tons of caffeine is a lot of cups of coffee. That's a lot. I don't do the math sometime. <laughs> but then maybe it's not surprising that the U.S. leads the world in consuming caffeine. I mean, I know a lot of people I would never dare talk to before they had their cup of coffee in the morning. <laughs> By your laugh, you know what I mean. I'm probably looking at some of them right now. <laughs> don't dare talk to me before my coffee. I'm pretty sure that we're desperate for coffee because we're desperately compensating for lack of rest. And why are we desperately compensating for lack of rest? I think at least in part, it's because we're taking so much on our shoulders as if the world depended on us. Maybe you know what I'm talking about. Ever have one of those nights where you wake up in a panic because of the to-do lists and deadlines that are looming over your head? Ever have one of those nights where you know you need to go to bed, but you really don't want to go to bed because you dread the next day, and if you go to bed earlier, uh, it just means that the, day, the next day is going to come sooner, and you'd rather not face it, and so you just stay up. You ever have one of these? Yeah, you know, every once in a while I have, you know, at the end of church, I'm in the back, I'm greeting people, uh, and, and someone will say, Pastor, have you been listening to my conversations? Have you been reading my mind? I, I can sort of, see, sort of see that working in you right now. Like, have you been listening to my conversations? I'll tell you, I do not have your phones tapped, and I have not been reading your mind. I don't have to, because this is my struggle, you, right? We all get this. <laughs> I... I pack way too much in my day, and I get too little sleep. I lose my temper because I don't have enough rest. I contribute to my share fare of the one and a quarter million days lost in productivity every year because of lack of sleep. Here's what I'd like us to think about. God created us with a need for sleep. We have to get sleep every single day. Our bodies are crafted in such a way that we need to lay down and stop everything. If we don't recharge our bodies, if we don't sleep, our bodies will just shut down. 
And my argument is that our need for sleep is not a burden, it's a gift from God. It's a gift that every single day we are reminded by God that we need to let go of all the worries and burdens and as if the world depended on us. It's a daily reminder. When we go to lay down at, at night, it's a reminder to us that the world is spinning on its axis, not by our power, but by God's power, right? The world is not going to somehow fall apart if you stop. The world's still going to spin while you're resting. And sleep is that daily reminder. Don't burden yourself with the weight of the world. That's God's job. When you go to sleep, you're really just, you're letting go. As, as some people say, let go and let God. Let him have it. Rest is a daily reminder of that. And God intended that we would have a weekly reminder of it. Not because it is just physically impossible to keep going, but that it would be a spiritual discipline to every week choose to lay it aside and to rest in him. It's a weekly reminder. So in the Ten Commandments, God gave a lot of commandments, but the top ten, right, includes number three, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And what's that Sabbath? What's the Sabbath day? It's a day of rest, right? Exodus 20, 9 to 10. Six days you'll labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Lord's Sabbath. Do not do any work. And again, just like the daily rest, that weekly rest is intended by God as a gift. A gift to us, a reminder to just trust God. Oh, how hard that is. Isn't that hard? To just, to choose to set aside all that needs to get done? Well, if, if I took an hour off, Pastor, you would not understand. No, if I took the whole day off, are you kidding me? Do you feel that ever? But we need to rediscover Sabbath. I'm convinced of it. Not in a legalistic way. You know, not, not as a burden, but to rediscover as a spiritual discipline the rhythm of weekly rest. It's something that Nehemiah knew the ancient Israelites needed to rediscover Sabbath. If you've been with us over the last few weeks, you know that we've been in the series uh, looking at the Old Testament book of Nehemiah. Uh, Pastor Tim mentioned this just a, a bit in the introduction to the reading. The content context of Nehemiah is that the people of, of God have been away in exile for over 70 years. The Babylonians had come and destroyed everything, destroyed Jerusalem and all the other cities, uh, hauled the people off into exile, and now they have a chance to come back, to rebuild. First, they rebuilt the temple, the house of God, place of worship. He rebuilt the temple, priority number one. Second thing was the defensive wall, and this was Nehemiah's job, to help to rebuild the defensive wall because they were vulnerable to attack by people all around them, so they built up the city wall. That's essentially the first half of Nehemiah. Rebuild the city, rebuild the wall. The second half of Nehemiah is about rebuilding the people. Rebuilding the people. So two weeks ago, our theme was recommitting to the Word of God. Recommitting ourselves to hearing God's Word. Last week, remembering that God is faithful even when our sins are terrible. God forgives and He's faithful in His love for us. Now, we're talking about returning to the Sabbath. So Nehemiah watches as the, the city's economy comes alive. The merchants are bringing supplies from all over the region around Jerusalem. Citizens are buying products and from all over. But it's happening also on the Sabbath as much as on any other day. And Nehemiah says, this is wrong. 
It wasn't all that long ago that the people had recommitted themselves to the word of God. And part of that word of God is the commandment, do no work on the Sabbath. And here they are doing all this work on the Sabbath. How quickly they forgot. So Nehemiah blockades the city gates. Just don't let anybody in with all the, the merchandise. He told the merchants, go away, come back tomorrow. Once or twice they came and slept all night outside the city gate, but it didn't take them long to figure out it's not going to happen here. So they rediscovered the blessing of Sabbath rest, taking that time away. Now, now I don't recommend that you go to do this today over at Walmart or Fleet Farm or Festival, okay? Don't, don't go blockading the doors and saying, no, we want to rediscover Sabbath. You're not, not going to go over well, all right? In fact, that's not the, not the greatest point of Nehemiah. The point is in rediscovering the Sabbath as a gift of God. Of course, it's more than physical. It's not just physical rest. There's more to it than that. I, I do highly recommend, by the way, that if you've not discovered this, not just being in church, you know, that, that's an hour or two that you're in church, but there, to actually take the day of Sabbath, rest, I, I highly recommend it. But it's not just physical, is it? As human beings, we are made up of body and soul. And Sabbath is for both. Our bodies need rest. Our souls need rest. You know, I, I, like to, I like to ask people to imagine going through the whole day without having any food. You know, no breakfast, no lunch, no dinner. Imagine, what, what are you going to feel like at 8 o'clock tonight if you had nothing to eat all day? A little hangry, right? <laughs> A little hungry, angry. Well, imagine a few days of not having any food. How are you going to feel? Or even more, if you had no coffee all week, like you're going to take someone's head off, literally, probably. Spiritually, we have the same need for food, soul food, right? We need our souls to be fed. Or you'll be spiritually hangry. Well, how do you get spiritual food? Go to Jesus. Remember Jesus said, I am the bread of life. But he's not talking about literal bread. He's talking about himself. He's, he is the bread of life. He is the one who gives food for the souls. Same with our rest. Our souls need rest just like our bodies need rest. How do you get that, pastor? How do you get the spiritual rest? I think Martin Luther was on to something when he gave an explanation of the third commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Martin Luther, back in the 1500s, wrote a small little book. It's called the Catechism, a small catechism. And he explains, right, unpacks a little bit what we mean when we confess and when we read these things from the scriptures about the Sabbath day and, and other things, but he asked the question, what does this mean? And Martin Luther said, then we should fear and love God so that we do not despise preaching in his word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. But coming and listening to the word of God preached and shared, gladly learn from it. Well, what does that have to do with rest? Well, Hearing the word of God is where we hear of Jesus. Jesus, who says, come to me all who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Not, not just physical rest, but spiritual rest. It's Jesus who laid down his life for us so that we would not have to strive any longer to please God. I can tell you how many times I have people come to me and they just... They're burdened with somehow having to prove themselves. They're, they're tired of proving themselves to their wife. They're tired of proving themselves to their, their, uh, their boss, their coworkers, to their community. They're tired of proving themselves to God. I said, why are you trying to prove yourself to God? Stop striving to impress God. There's, 
nothing you can do that will make God love you more. And nothing you can do that's going to make God love you less. Christ came to die so that you would be forgiven and have no need to strive to win God's favor anymore. You know how it feels when you, really, when you get a really good night of sleep? You ever have one of those? Some of you are going, oh, yeah, I have no idea what you're talking about, Pastor. <laughs> you know, when we just, you wake up in the morning and, you know, wow, I'm refreshed and I, my body is recharged, my head is clear, I'm ready for the day. Get that kind of revigorating rest for your soul by giving Sabbath a try. Like just, just put aside all the stuff on your to-do list for a while. You know, the, you know about um, Sabbath on the Oregon Trail? Pastor Tim was just telling me about this this morning. There are two concepts, the Oregon Trail. You know, as pioneers were going across the, the plains and the mountains all the way to the Pacific Ocean, they would leave Missouri and one train of thought was, okay, you get to the Pacific, you get to Oregon as quickly as you can. You work every single day, you go as far as you can every single day until you get there. The other train of thought was, you go every day except on Sunday, no matter how favorable the weather is for traveling, you rest on the Sabbath. And you know what happened? On average, those who were taking the Sabbath off every week made it to Oregon two weeks earlier than those that worked day after day after day every single day. Two weeks earlier. And on average, one-tenth the loss of life on the way. Because they weren't wearing out their animals and wearing out their wagons and wearing out the people with work. They rested. That's what God offers to us in the Sabbath. It's good for us. Even if we think it's going to be hard, it's a gift. Stop striving and rest. Amen? Amen. Our ushers are going to come forward here and receive an offering and pass the baskets through, the, through each row. Thank you for your giving. And as we receive our offering, we hear the song and consider its words for our blessing.
If you are able to, please rise for prayer. Merciful Father, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us. Ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love, receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Gathered in the name of Jesus, let us turn to our Heavenly Father and pray for the world, for the church, and for all people according to their needs. Abba, Father, your thoughts are not our thoughts. Your ways are not our ways. In your wisdom, you've permitted natural disasters and personal tragedies that have caused many people to struggle with the grief and loss and despair. Draw us close and sustain us, O Lord, and may your unfailing love be our comfort especially during the most difficult times in our lives. Abba, Father, sin has corrupted us from the time of Adam and Eve, and our society continues to redefine sin based upon human experience and human desire. Our true identity found in Christ can easily be replaced by the idols within our hearts, which lead us away from the purity and truth of your word. Draw us close and sustain us, O Lord, and nurture us like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season. Abba, Father, we are blessed by a saving faith in Jesus, and he is the perfecter of it. Our world today is becoming more and more hostile to the gospel, and we often find ourselves scared and persecuted or rejected, even within our own families and circle of friends. Draw us close and sustain us, O Lord, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. Abba, Father, you have given us a variety of talents in which to use within the body of Christ for the benefit of others. Help us to recognize our talents and to use them to the best of our abilities and for your glory. Draw us close and sustain us, O Lord, and help us to remember that we are the body of Christ and each one of us has a part of it. Abba, Father, we give you thanks and praise for doctors, nurses, and therapists who use the gift of medicine to maintain and restore our health. Through their talents, grant relief to all those who struggle with mental and physical illness, those who are undergoing testing for unknown health issues, and those who are scheduled for or recovering from surgery. We pray especially for Roy Hintz, who is in the hospital this week, for Judy Salter, Edith Krieger, and Marge Doms, who are recovering from surgery. Grant them patience, comfort, and healing according to your gracious and good will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray today, Abba Father, for those who are mourning the loss of loved ones. There are many in our our family of faith this week. We pray for the the, the, the family of Sharon Wackel, the family of Susan Kerrigan, the family of Rhoda Heidman, the family of Steve Kroll, the family of Hank Bauer, all who are called home to your near presence to rest from their labors for good. We pray for Mary Nimmer and her family at the passing of her father this week. God, we pray that you would comfort each and every one of those who are mourning Comfort them with the promise of the resurrection, the assurance of life eternal, and the reunion that is assured for us by the work of Christ with those who die in faith. Lord, we lift up those who are celebrating today, celebrating the gift of life. We celebrate with our our families of two-year-olds who receive their first Bibles. We celebrate with those who are coming to the waters of baptism, including little Nora Zimmerman, 
baptized this morning. We pray celebration with those who are joined in marriage. Ken Close and Ellen Shabo, who were married here yesterday. For Laura Schultz and Jacob Nance, who will be married this coming Wednesday. And we also rejoice with those who are marking special anniversaries. Thank you for the example they are to their families and to us as a congregation, to our community, faithfulness and service to one another. We thank you for Jerry and Sharon Vanden Heuvel are celebrating 58 years. Dennis and Millie Went who are celebrating their 59th wedding anniversary. And Carl and Pat Kishorek who are celebrating their 63rd wedding anniversary. We thank you, Lord, for each and every one of them and we pray your blessing upon them. Into your hands, Heavenly Father, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And Father, hear us as Jesus taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Truly, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and forever and ever and ever grant you his peace. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our closing hymn this morning comes from Lutheran Service Book 921. On what has been sown, on what has now been sown, thy blessing, Lord, bestow. The power is thine alone to make it sprout and grow. Do thou in grace the harvest raise, and thou alone shall have the praise. We thank you for joining us for today's worship service from the Faith Ministry Center of Faith Lutheran Church. All the members of Faith Lutheran Church invite you to join us for any of our worship services. We would enjoy sharing the time with you. For Ministry Center locations, worship and education times, please visit our website at www faithfoxvalley.org or call the church office at 739-9191. Any communications regarding this broadcast can be directed to Stephen Moore, Director of Worship, Faith Lutheran Church, 601 East Glendale Avenue, Appleton, Wisconsin, 54911. Until we meet again, may the Lord bring you peace.
Thank you.